We're very excited to have Robert Criscow. Robert Criscow is one of the three or four people who invented rock journalism. Uh, his newest book is called Going Into the City, Portrait of a Critic as a Young Man. He's probably also the first person ever to say in print that he hated the Eagles. Um, uh, Nathan Rabin is here with us. Uh, he is a writer, author, uh, national treasurer, and very other, uh, various other things as well. Uh, he has written about this phenomenon, about this phenomenon, about the divisiveness, the passions that get excited about the uh, Eagles. But we want to talk first to Eric Lichter. Eric Lichter is a musician, producer. He's the owner, op- operator, founder, proprietor of the uh, Dirt Floor uh, Studios. And, and he comes to us. I was getting nervous li- uh, watching you during that story because I know that you love the Eagles. But I also know from our lengthy communications about this that you've just heard it all before, right? There's nothing that anybody's going to say about the Eagles in a negative way that you just haven't heard. Well, you know, let me start off by saying I don't have an altar in my house, (laughs) you know, for the Eagles. I I do love them. You know, I was raised on them and and the California sound and the other groups associated with them. You know, and I was also around after you know, the initial peak. So, you know, it's all nostalgia for me. I just love the music. I love sweet melodies and, and, and people get so vitriolic. You know, I, I save hate for music that preaches hate, you know, and things like that. Um, I get it if you're indifferent to a a group or a type of music, like I am with Van Morrison. It's like, Mm -hmm. I get Van Morrison. I get why people love him. But for me, it's just, eh, it's the same song over and over again. So it comes down to personal preference, really. And but w- the phenomenon that you're describing is a familiar one, I think, to most of us, which is that, you know, you and I or you you and any person you might meet over the rest of the course of the day, it might turn out that you like a lot of the same things, you know, uh, as you r- sort of ticked through a whole list of musical acts. It might turn out that you and that other person were pretty simpatico, and then maybe there would be some places where you just, you know, there were forks in the road, and they really liked Van Morrison. Yeah, you not so much and everything like that. But it does seem like the Eagles are a special thing, right? You have a lot of people that you know, that you enjoy, who you share a lot of enthusiasm with, and you are just off 180 degrees in opposite directions. Yeah, it is like, you know, it's a dirty word, which is very puzzling. It's been puzzling to me. Um, As a producer, you know, when I get to uh, work on records for people, I I put these little Easter eggs in their records. They're going to kill me. I mean, they're all out there going, (laughs) what? So I'll throw a little guitar lick in there, a little Joe Walsh thing, or uh, I worked with an artist named Carrie Powers, uh, and, and I think she's been here, and she has a great song that I know John Dankosky loves mm-hmm. called Old Shirt, and I threw in these harmonies that, that are these ascending harmonies that are very much like Randy Meisner, Take It to the Limit. Yeah. But people are like, man, that's really, I love what you did there. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you love the Eagles then, don't you? No, but I hate the Eagles. I mean, you know. All right, so uh, get your lawsuits ready. It turns out that... Uh, <laughs> That Eric's been sneaking uh, Eagle songs into your tracks as he produces you. Uh, (laughs) GMOs. All all right. So, um, Robert Criscow, uh, it could be said that you saw this coming, that in 1972, writing about the... I wasn't looking. I wasn't trying to see anything coming. Okay. Uh, First of all, I I knew this band was a talented band that was going to be a good band. I was a newspaper columnist. It seemed to me to be appropriate for me to write a column about them because uh, there wasn't any question in my mind that... Although I don't think I predicted as much, quite as much in 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 the piece I ended up writing, I certainly implied it, and um, uh, and I had my problems with it, and I thought I should say why uh, I, I you know I predicting this? No, I didn't predict this. All right, I, I, you know I barely knew who they were. For goodness' sake. Well, what you what, what you did say? Yes, you, you, I'm not an astronomist. You, <laughs> you did write that they were yeah the tightest and most accomplished rock band to emerge since Neil Young's Crazy Horse. Uh, they were different. Yeah, well, from, turned, I think that's wrong. They were tighter and more accomplished back then. Uh, and and you said, well, what's the difference? And that's with the Crazy Horse that had uh, um, oh I forgot the guy had Jack. Oh, I, now I'm it'll, sorry. It'll, it'll come it, it was the best Crazy Horse. The cra- Crazy Horse got worse. All right. but, but I, I love them, <laughs> but they're not, a, they're not an accomplished Would it be band. Danny Witten? Are we talking about Danny yeah, Witten? Right, Danny yeah. Witten yeah. So um, you saluted their chemistry. Uh, you said they're an organic group, not a mixture of musicians uh, that they can execute. Uh, not only do they all sing and compose, which is nothing new, they're good at it. Uh, and you went on to talk about other aspects of it. But then you wrote this famous line. People, it comes up, right? Right. Uh, it's, uh, it's the second most famous 
line I ever wrote. Another thing that interests me about the Eagles is that I hate them. Hate is the kind of uptight word that automatically excludes one from polite post-hippie circles, a good reason to use it. But it's also meant to convey an anguish that is very intense, yet difficult to pinpoint. Do I hate music that has been giving me pleasure all weekend, made by four human beings I've never met? Yeah, I think so. Listening to the Eagles has left me feeling alienated from things I used to love. As the culmination of rock's country strain, the group is also the culmination of the counterculture reaction that strain epitomizes. Well, there, we, there you have... See, my objection to the Eagles was not, and remains actually, not primarily musical. It is primarily, sorry to say, may make me unpopular, political. Mm. I perceive something in them politically that, by the way, um, I, I turned out, I did turn out to be right about, even though Don Henley, who I think is the, the mo- single most dislikable, I was going to say odious, I think that's overdoing it a little bit, uh, dislikable of, of the members of the Eagles, um, uh, you know, as in many ways associated himself with liberal causes and has actually given money, I'm down with that, but Michael Bolton, who I don't like either, was the single most important musical supporter of Bill Clinton in 1992, you know, uh, you know. Good, you know, bad artists do good things, and good artists do bad things, too. All right, I'm going to hold it right there for just a second, um, and I want to uh, add, and I know Eric has some things that he wants to say about even the, the quote that I just read, but let's add Nathan into this conversation, too, and let's add you, too. 860-275-7266 is a number that you can call. Please uh, do not uh, challenge the uh, young lady who answers the phone to fight you. Uh, 860-275-7266. Uh, we will be fist fight free today, ideally. You can also tweet us at W. WNPR Colin, our tweet master Greg Hill is all ready for you at WNPR Colin. So, um, and we're talking about the Eagles and kind of why they excite such passions, both on the uh, side of adoration and on the side of repulsion. Uh, Nathan Raven, as I say, is joining us. Uh, he wrote about this for the AV Club. Um, so, Nathan, this is a chasm that you tried to explore, right? That that. There's something about the Eagles that makes a certain contingent very, very happy and another contingent happy to hate them. Oh, totally. Well, and I think one of the, my sort of fascinations as a writer and something that I've explored a lot is things that are despised, things that are reviled. Uh, my last book, uh, You Don't Know Me But You Don't Like Me, was about fish and an insane clown posse, um, both of whom I came to love deeply, deeply, deeply and unironically and unambiguously uh, over the course of writing this book. And while I was writing this article about the eagles, again, I think it was uh, from the standpoint of defending them, of finding something valid, something uh, of substance. And I think they're definitely is a lot there. I mean, they're undeniably impressive from a musicianship standpoint, from from a polished standpoint, from a craftsmanship standpoint. But there is something, as Mr. Krisko said so eloquently, there's something fundamentally soulless, uh, enervating and aggravating about it. And I think a lot of it comes down to politics, but also to personalities. Uh, I you don't need to know Don Henley to despise him. And actually, the more you know about the Eagles, the easier it becomes to hate them. Uh, and I didn't realize that this was research at the time, but I watched the three hour long uh, documentary about the Eagles. And the whole purpose of that is to build their brand, to establish them as these incredibly important cultural figures. And it was very authorized, very polished. And it's almost impossible to come away from that uh, movie and not despise Don Henley and Glenn Fry on a personal level, even as their music is almost aggressively, uh, offensively inoffensive. Well, now, Eric, um, this is, as I say, nothing's going to come up here that Eric hasn't already heard. Uh, So, and so this is one of the arguments. We might as well get into it right now. I was going to save this for later. But one of the arguments is, well, they're just not nice people. Well, you know, uh, well, first of all, I want to say, Robert, I'm a a big fan uh, of yours. And, um, (laughs) you know, I. Yeah, I have heard it. And, you know, it's hard to be the guy that, you know, I feel like I'm sort of the one that's against the ropes. I have to defend this band that doesn't really (laughs) need defending. But we're talking about them as human beings, right? Well, yeah, just let's let's do that for Um, a few minutes anyway. Well, you know, I don't I don't know all there is to know. But I know as a human being, I'd, I never judge someone unless I'm, you know, unless I've spent time with them on a personal level. And, you know, I have a few. I've spent some time with Joe Walsh, you know, when I was a kid. And that's a long story. But he, he was 
pretty incredible to me. Uh, he was a mess. This would be uh, in the early 90s, and he hadn't sobered up yet. But he he was a very cool guy, uh, that aside. Um, if I haven't spent time with these guys. I can't say you know for certain that this guy's a jerk or that guy's a jerk. Do I agree with everything they do? No. But again, I just listen to their music, and I know you know that it makes me feel good to get in my car and throw on you know the desperado record you know and 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 i think that's also part of the problem is uh you know the constant replaying of the same songs over and over again but as people i don't know them i can't make that that call you know one thing that i think and one reason that i admire uh eric and what you're doing today is that i think you know for a certain kind of person who fancies himself as hip in a certain way. This has become, hating the Eagles has become kind of a thing, right? It's a thing. It's kind of a hip thing. We know from the world of movies, one of the things that made it a hip thing. In fact, Chuck Klosterman in his essay about this says this is the thing that catapulted him temporarily into the world of hating the Eagles is just watching this particular movie and this particular clip. Jesus, man, could you change the channel? You man, feel like my music. Get your own cat. I had a really rough. Pull up to the side and kick out. Man, come on. I had a rough night, and I hate the Eagles, man. So there you have the, the precursor to the fist fight that Charlie Erickson almost had. And you've got both sides, too, right? You've got the, the dude, he hates the Eagles, and you've got the cab driver who is apparently passionate enough about the Eagles to throw somebody out, throw a <laughs> presumably paying customer out of his cab. But Nathan, you know, in, in a certain way, that moment, and, and boy, once we announced that we were doing this show, about 85 people sent us this clip like we wouldn't have known about it, um, it kind of made it easy. You know, your, your book about it saying uh, Clown Posse and Fish, um, well, I mean, it's to do that, to hate them, you first of all have to explain to other people who they are and stuff like that. Whereas, like, it got kind of easy to hate the Eagles, right? It, got, it was a very dry, cool, I reject uh, corporate rock position that you really didn't ha- even have to work very hard at, right? Oh, totally. I mean, that's the thing is people, uh, you know, your average American uh, doesn't really know who Fish or the Indian Club has he is, uh, whereas everybody knows the Eagles. They're incredibly, incredibly popular. And that makes them a much, much bigger target for hate. Uh, I think there's also the sense that they are the establishment. Uh, you know, they're I think Hotel California was in the top 50 of like Rolling Stones, uh, you know, greatest albums of all time. And they're kind of, you know, the, exactly the kind of uh, band that Rolling Stone likes that John Wenner uh, would throw his support behind. And um, yeah, I think a lot of the hostility towards them is because they kind of took something that was uh, very soulful, very uh, non-commercial, a very kind of uh, organic, which was sort of this country rock thing that, you know, sort of Graham Parsons was kind of uh, creating and made it uh, kind of corporate and soulless and cynical and incredibly, incredibly commercial. It's like they brought something to incredible popularity and destroyed it at the same time. That's sort of the argument. Well, Robert Crisco, I'm also wondering, did you told me via email that you're going to be listening to some Eagles to kind of get ready for this conversation. How, how do they I really have nothing I I don't think a commercial is a, an insult. Yeah. I don't I think soulless is a very very vague term. Um I have I, I like Iggy Azalea for goodness sake. <laughs> I like I like there are Backstreet Boys songs I think are just great. So how do the Eagles sound to you in 2015? They don't sound unlistenable, but, um, but uh, listen, I, one thing, I mean, I've always loved um, uh, Old 55, but mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is, the reason I love Old 55 is, A, it's a great song, they didn't write it, and I prefer Tom Waits' version to their version. And I was thinking, you know, at the, at the same time I'm enjoying Old 55, I do think it's a wonderful song, and they do a decent job of it. Peaceful, easy, easy feeling. That that song that the uh, that the Big Lebowski uh, mm. w- was pawning on. That's mm. an okay song, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, um, I, I mean, one of the one of my problems with them ideologically is, oh, how did I put it? I found it. Uh, uh, 
I, I can't now. I can't find the words, but uh, uh, you can songs, tell us the, why. The songs about male. The songs about male independence are very passionate. The songs about female females tend to be put downs. But they the, are sexist in a typical rock way. I was going to say you could say that about so much yeah. of rock culture, yes, right? Yes, you can. And, but but uh, uh, just because they're so skillful. They make it a, a, a more culturally acceptable position. Um, uh, the, um, I mean, and 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 right at the center of it is 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 that country rock. Right, Grand Parsons is great, but I prefer the Eagles to Poco <laughs> by a lot. Our, uh, <laughs> really, uh, 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 and I don't prefer him to, to Grant Parsons. Grant Parsons was a genius and, uh, and and an extraordinary musician, and I don't think that's true of anybody in in the Eagles. Um, uh, so it's, but I mean, I I just don't. I, I do believe that the very pervasiveness of uh, their greatest hits album, which is one of the best selling albums of all time, or of, I mean, it does Young Winter love Hotel California? I don't even know. Is he? I mean, he's friends with lots of people. Is he friends with Henley? Might be. I don't know the fact of that. Um, uh, um, uh, but definitely makes them easier to hate simply because they're so popular. I have no use for that. All right. I love. I love Michael Jackson's Thriller, which is even more popular. Right. So it's very commercial. The fact that they're popular is no excuse uh, for hating them. That uh, the Eagles get blamed for everything. Chris Squire from that tr- tr- the same tour, the basis for Yes. Claims that they're the Eagles. It's the Eagles' fault that the, that yes, all got addicted to cocaine. That uh, the Eagles showed them cocaine and how great it was. He says, if you want to know why we all wound up hooked on cocaine, blame the Eagles. See, they blame them for everything. Eric Lichter is here in studio with me. Uh, he is the uh, founder, proprietor, and producer uh, at the Dirt Floor Studios. Uh, Robert Criscow, legendary rock critic, uh, is joining us from his apartment in New York. Nathan Rabins from the studios of WBEZ in Chicago. He's a writer, author, national treasure. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Eric, uh, I'm going to come back to you for a second and and, uh, and talk about some of the things that have been said so far. Yeah. So it seems to me that everything... One of the reasons that we have this chasm is that everything that is an eagle's weakness is an eagle's strength, right? So yeah. we, we can talk about a few of those things. Um, so let's talk about one thing that just came up is, okay, so they appropriated country, a country sound, without necessarily buying in the way that maybe people want well, them to. So they're not Graham Parsons, they're not John Prine, they're not Johnny Cash, they're not George Jones. On the other hand, Bonnie Raitt went to Radcliffe. Uh, and then she recorded a lot exactly. of country music, and she didn't take the same kind of heat. So um, I've been biting my tongue for the last <laughs> ten minutes. You could see that. Um, He's been fidgeting. You know, in the end, I know this is all ridiculous. It just yeah. makes for great for great radio. You know, what we have to do is, and what I do typically when I'm trying to, you know, I, I don't try to win people over. It's mm. like you know, if you don't like something, you're never gonna. Mm. Um, uh, although I, I came around to Warren Zevon about a dozen years ago, and I'm, I'm glad I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but you take the, these individuals uh, before their first record came out, and I think the first record and Desperado as a concept album mm-hmm. has a ton of soul. So mm-hmm. people th- were throwing around this lack of soul thing, mm-hmm. and you know that's ridiculous to me. I mean, those records are full of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, gradually they got a little more polished as time went on. So you have um, you have Randy Meisner, who yes was in Poco, an inferior band. Although they, I think they had some good cuts in there, and Richie Fure, who is in the Buffalo Springfield, was in that group. And, and Jim, his, Jim Messina was in it, and too. Jim was in that group as well. But uh, you know they had their moments. Timothy B. Schmidt, who I'm not a fan of, so mm-hmm. I'm going to go go on record. I, I don't think he f- was right for the Eagles. I liked it better when Randy was in that band, um, and I think he just he got a you know he made out. Like, because he's still in the band, so right. he's making tons of money, and where's Randy? But you had Randy, who was in Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon band. Now, he he was incredible. Mm-hmm. He made some great stuff. And, you know, he played with James Taylor, uh, you know, Sweet Baby James. Um, and I know Henley and Fry uh, were working with Linda Ronstadt. And they had a mm-hmm. couple other things before that. So they, you know, they all paid their dues, and they were, and Bernie Leadon. Uh, was in the Burrito Brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a flying Burrito Brother. So these guys definitely earned 
they had some authentic country jobs. Yeah, they paid their country dues, rock man. They- Once again, their strengths are their weaknesses. So one of their strengths is they, they endure, right? This is now a 40-plus-year-old band. I mean, they've been around that long. Um, and, and I think one of the things that their fans love about them, the people who love the Eagles, they love the fact that the sound that started in 1972, although it's mutated and changed, the lineups changed and stuff like that, they think it's still sort of access things that were, you know, if they are of an appropriate age, if, if they're not 30, that, you know, there's just this tremendous continuity. Now, the thing that, one of the things that people hate about them, I assume, is that they won't die. They won't die, they won't go away, that they are as ubiquitous in 2015 as they were in 1977, or whatever their peak, or their theoretical peak was. The, the, the fact is, their, their theoretical peak turns out to be, right, this mesa that we're just living on for the rest of the history of pop culture. I mean, do you think people hold their longevity against them? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, again, part of part of the hostility uh, towards the Eagles is just that they're so ubiquitous and they never go away. And even when they were broken up, um, their music was just everywhere. It was part of the Amer- fabric of American culture. And I think they occupy this place by virtue of their incredible popularity, by virtue of, you know, the ubiquity of their songs, by virtue of their longevity that, you know, other albums like, you know, to cite you know, from the top 10, you know, the uh, Thriller, which I agree is, is an amazing album. And there's nothing wrong uh, with being commercial, um, you know, but there's a giant difference from an album like uh, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band uh, that endures because it's great and will never go away because the world needs it. And uh, the Beatles greatest or the, uh, the Eagles greatest hits, which endures because it is you know, nobody could object to it, and it can play in a Starbucks anywhere in the world, uh, and seem perfectly at home, and nobody would be too uh, upset by it. You know, their music is uh, very, very pleasant, um, but for that level of popularity, that level of uh, esteem, it should be a whole lot more than just uh, agreeable. All right, so um, Robert Criscow, another theory I have, okay, is that this music is very seductive. It sounds very, very, it sounds nice, and, and it sounds great in all the ways that you in 1972 were describing how good it really sounded. And there is, in the review that you wrote, a little bit of a sense of Jesus being taken out into the wilderness and tempted by Satan, you know, that, that you hear this music and it, it re- you really like it a lot. It's made you happy for a whole weekend of listening to it. And but then you decide to reject it, and I'm wondering if no, that's. No, I didn't decide to reject. It. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. no. You, if, if you don't criticize from your gut, then you're not good at your job. Mm. I criticize from my gut. Right. Uh, there was no decision involved. Uh, I mean, that's exa- that's what bad critics do. Right. What's the right position to take about this music? No, yeah. no, you no, you find out. You have to be in touch with your pleasure centers. See what actually gives you pleasure and what doesn't, how it works. In, 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 my, in this case, it was, a, it was a complex experience that I try to describe. Right. And then gradually over the years, their self-importance, which is different than their success. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, once again, I think uh, 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 Some Girls, which came out in 1978 by a much bigger band than the Eagles at that time, the Rolling Stones, I think that's a fine record. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not about the success. It's about the self-importance, the pomposity. That's what Mojo Nixon is getting out of that song. I mean, I, I think that record, I, my, my review of that, The End of Innocence, it begins, bitch, 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 bloat, bloat, bloat. That's, six of ten tracks run over five minutes. Six of ten tracks over five minutes. That's just self-importance. And, oh. and, and uh, I hope before we go, we can discuss the question of Frank Ocean's American Wedding. Do you know anything about that? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, Eric, maybe, maybe you even want to talk about that right now, Eric. Go ahead. I'm going to get in trouble here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I agree with Robert about uh, criticizing from your gut. I believe, you know, I, that's how I do it. And, uh, you know, um, anyway, that's a great point. But, uh, I, I, you know, I bring up the Frank Ocean thing uh, to a lot of folks um, because I know that, uh, and Robert, c- correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, I know that he basically took the entire backing track. Mm-hmm. He oh. actually messed with it a little bit, which I'm sure made Henley even madder. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a few really interesting ways. He thinned down the guitar at the beginning. He put different percussion in there. Uh, no, it's not the it's not the backing track, but he does use the Joe Walsh uh, solo 
I haven't actually a beat it, so I'm yeah. not sure that the sound is exactly the same. I, I listened to it this Ocean morning. And Ocean is smart about this stuff, so I wouldn't be surprised if he did mess with it a little bit. But it's subtle. So we, we should, for people who are completely lost right now, so Frank Ocean, who's a kind of a, a, artist, almost an R&B artist, comes out of the hip-hop tradition, though, and he's actually really wonderful. I really enjoy him a lot. So this is a song where he, he more, Eric, he more than sampled Hotel California, oh, right? It's, uh, I listened to it this morning, uh, and I had heard it when it, you know, I heard it when it came out, mm. and it, it's just unmistakable. Yeah. When you hear it, I mean, it's, you know, I don't think he's trying to hide it. He also didn't make any money on that. There was no money to be made, which, mm-hmm. you know, I know that people, that was people's argument. Well, you know, he wasn't making money. Mm-hmm. And then Henley went after him. And, you know, I write songs. I'm, you know, on the other end of the financial spectrum from Don Henley. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, he's still an artist. You know, I know he's he's a pompous, arrogant jerk. You know, we we know this already. But he's an artist, and you know, it's if he wants to protect his, you know, what we're going to call intellectual property, then then good for him. You know, that's all I have to say about it, really. Um, well, yeah, but uh, you know, to that point too, um, Nathan, we have to go to a break here pretty soon. But I think one thing that maybe fuels a little bit of what we're talking about this sort of the, the way that people say that they hate the Eagles and they use that word hate um, is that the Eagles hate the Eagles, right? I mean, this is an unusually divisive group of people. We have famously the 1980 concert where uh, where Glenn Fry was counting down the songs to the end on stage, audibly to the audience, f- to win the concert win in so that he could beat up Don Fell. Uh, and he'd, I think, broken a bottle and waved at it at him before they went out on stage. That and that, you know, that Bernie Leadon and Randy Meisner left the band with various levels of either hurt feelings or revulsion. That there's a sense uh, that uh, seems even to emerge in the documentary that there's tension between the two guys who really are supposed to be the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid of this band, uh, Henley and Fry. That one of the things that may fuel some of this feeling about the Eagles is that. You know, the Beatles on their worst day, I don't think, had this kind of friction. I I don't know. Am I wrong about that? No, I think you're entirely right. And I think people are understandably skeptical of bands where there are two people who are in charge. uh, And then there are people who are employees uh, who can be uh, fired in any moment. I feel like uh, Kiss was kind of that way. Although Steely Dan Dan doesn't take a lot of heat for that. And it couldn't be more two people, right? Oh, totally. But again, I think it's just, a, <laughs> I love Steely Dan. I don't know anybody other than the two people. Right. Uh, whereas with the Eagles, it was definitely a matter of there were these guys who were a, an important part of kind of building that sound who were just kind of dismissed. And, you know, with, with Kiss, at least, uh, you know, Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons don't like a lot of other people in the world, but they really like each other. Whereas Don Henley and Glenn Fry uh, seem to hate all of their bandmates and hate each other as well, yet are in this <laughs> position of empower. And again, I think there's just this incredible sense of entitlement uh, for for Henley and Fry, where there's a sense of like we deserve everything. And I think when people think of limousine liberals, uh, Don Henley is kind of the perfect example of that. And I I agree. I agree with him politically on everything. Like he's done a lot for the environment, um, but he's done it in a way that is just so uh, self pitying and so self righteous and so all about him, as opposed to what he's actually agitating for. Although you got to love a band where I think I'm stealing this from Bill Simmons, where the Yoko Ono is Alan Cranston. I mean, that, that's you know, the <laughs> idea that, that Alan Cranston would it's be true. the divisive force in the band. All right, we're going to take a break, so we'll have time for the end. Uh, we're going to continue expl- to explore this chasm, this fissure in the American soul. So I have this theory that I'm going to bring up with all three of you. I'm going to start with you, Eric. And and, sure. and and I think now that I've met you a little bit, my theory makes even more sense because you seem to be a relatively happy, well-adjusted person. You know, you seem to be very comfortable with yourself and comfortable in your own skin. And I have this theory that's, that, that hating the Eagles has something to do with the listener's mix of self-loathing and resentment of sort of um, mass culture happiness around him. You know, that there's a kind of person, and I'm a little bit that kind of person, who enjoys enjoys finding the worm in the apple more than he enjoys eating the apple. And the bigger and brighter and shinier the apple is, the more fun it is to find the worm in it. You know, why can't I be happy joining the throngs at the Coliseum, hoisting my brewski in the air and singing heartache tonight along with everybody else? Because I'm deep and I'm moody and I'm complicated and I'm not made happy by the things that make other people happy. Um, I think I just did describe myself. And I know I described Jonathan McNichol. Per- I mean, in fact, Jonathan McNichol doesn't like the Eagles, except he found out when we were doing the show that a lot of people don't like the uh, Eagles, and that made him 
hate himself for not liking the Eagles. He's probably ready to read Nathan's book and learn to like Insane Clown Posse, too. But I mean, I, you know, Eric, you do seem like you're a happy person. For me, it's really just about the music. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, music to me is therapy. It's it. There's no greater thing that puts us in a time. It brings us back to a special time, mm-hmm. whether that's listening to Insane Clown Posse, drinking Fago. You know what I mean? Um, I know who those guys are. Those I reserve my hate for that band right there. But um, uh, you know, it's it's a personal thing. At the end of the day, I don't care if Don Henley's a jackass. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, it makes me feel good and in. I don't know if I'm answering this question. No, you, you are answering the question. At and so all. I'm going to go to Nathan for a second, too. I mean, I think you know what I'm talking about, too. It's really, if you want to identify, self identify as a person who's just gone off the reservation of American mass culture and commercialism, I mean, first of all, you're going to identify with the dude. I mean, how, what better person for you to identify? I'm the dude. I'm off the reservation. I'm not participating anymore. And, and a really easy signifier for that is to say, I hate the Eagles. Totally. Uh, but I also feel like they are a lot more hateable than a lot of things that are incredibly <laughs> popular uh, in our society. And I love uh, I love loving things. I hate hating things. I've kind of uh, sought out things that people revile and try and find things that are good. But I feel like the Eagles have kind of defeated me uh, in that respect. And I, you know, I wrote this article in which I sort of semi kind of defended them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I was thinking. Today, I was heading over to the studio, like, I should bone up on the Eagles and listen to them and their music, and then I realized that I didn't keep any of their music. I deleted all of it from my iTunes, which I think was kind of my brain saying, you know, there are wonderful things you took with you from, you know, this country series that did a few years back. Uh, the Eagles is not one of them. Mm-hmm. You do not need them in your life anymore. And I actually find myself uh, reading books about them and watching documentaries about them because I'm fascinated by them mm-hmm. in ways that don't have anything to do with their music. Uh, interesting or uninterestingly enough. So, Robert Criscow, you know, you said before what a critic has to do. A critic really does have to keep his heart and his ears and his mind as pure as possible. But that's not what listeners do, right? Listeners use music as identifiers and signifiers. And so it, somebody's approach to the Eagles really may have an awful lot to do with just kind of where they view their own place in the culture and how they feel about Absolutely. other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But as far you know, as a critic, I'm interested in what I regard as aesthetic criteria and i would suggest that one of the problems with the eagles is that i mean my experience lou reed was a jerk as a person uh, he made a lot of ve- he treated me personally badly he made a lot of great music it didn't matter in the case of don henley and 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 glenn fry they're jerks and you can hear it and it gets bigger and bigger as they go along. So we're running out of time, and Eric Lichter, since you've uh, had to do the hardest job, I think you've had to roll the bigger rock up the hill here, uh, I'm going to let you um, have perhaps the last word. You know, one of the things that keeps coming up, obviously, is commercial success and money, you know, this notion that they're in it for the money. But isn't it, I mean, is that really such a bad thing? I mean, uh, isn't everybody in it for the money? I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. you said you're on the opposite end of the spectrum Listen. from Don Henley, but not by necessarily because you don't want to make any money. Well, I don't think any of us gets into it because we want want to just get by, you mm-hmm. know, and I don't think the guys, uh, the four original Eagles knew, you know, hey, man, we're going to be the biggest thing in the world. You know what I mean? I think they, their hearts were in the right place. They wanted to make music. I think along the way they take on, you know, first off, we already know the kind of guy Don Henley is, mm-hmm. whatever, for better or worse. He's probably, I don't know. I have a friend who nannied for Glenn, and she said he was incredible, by the way. Um, but, you know, they had Irving Azoff for a manager. They called him the Poison Dwarf. That was like his nickname. You know, I mean, there's all these influences. And of course, success changes a person. And, um, you know, uh, just listen to the music. If you like it, great. If you don't, change the channel. Perfect place to end. Thanks to Nathan Rabin, uh, national treasurer and writer. Robert Criscow, his new book is Going Into the City, Portrait of a Critic as a Young Man. And especially to Eric Lichter from the Dirt Floor Studios. Excuse me, somebody, does anybody know why the song keeps repeating its chorus? Oh, you're in hell. You can check out anytime. Thanks, you- I got it. Welcome to the hotel, California.